when William the Third and Mary the Second took the throne in 1689, they commissioned Sir Christopher Wren to build an elegant new Baroque palace. Later, Georgian kings and princes occupied the splendid interiors. When the royals left in 1737, impoverished grace and favor aristocrats moved in. Today we are going to take a historical tour of King William the Third and King George's apartments. When Mary was invited to rule in 1688, she refused to do so without William by her side. They were the first and only couple to rule jointly. Crowned jointly in 1689, Protestant monarchs William and Mary oversaw important moves towards parliamentary democracy. They also transformed Hampton Court Palace and Kensington Palaces. Within months of their accession, the royal couple had commissioned Sir Christopher Wren and the original plans had intended that the Tudor Palace of King Henry VIII would be entirely demolished, retailing only the Great Hall and then replaced with a more modern palace. The problem was that funds were not available to finance the ambitious project and Wren eventually revised his vision to include two additional sections of the palace to accommodate the new state apartments for the king and the queen. After entering through the great gatehouse coming out into the base court, you will pass by the Anne Boleyn gatehouse and into the clock court. This is the part which separates the Tudor buildings. So the Tudor building is on the left and the Stuart and Georgian buildings to the right. I would recommend starting to the left and touring the section of the palace since in the timeline of the history of England, the Tudor period of Wolsey and the King Henry preceded the Stuart period of William and Mary and later the Georgian period. After visiting the Tudor sections of Hampton Court, you can proceed into the Stuart and Georgian sections of the palace. Entrance to the King's State Apartments is under the colonnade in the Clock Court. The Grand King's Staircase leads you to the main rooms of the King's State Apartments. The King's Staircase was painted by the Italian painter Antonio Verrio and the mural is called Victory of Alexander over the Caesars. There is also a lovely wrought iron balustrade that was designed by Jean Tijoux. He was a French iron worker and patron of William and Mary. You can look for Verio's signature which can be seen at the top of the stairs over the door leading into the guard chamber. The twelve Caesars represent the Catholic forces that William has ousted in the glorious revolution. William is the hero Alexander. The palace was built and the Protestant kingdom secured the twin legacies of King William and Mary. Perhaps the finest moment of their reign was right at the beginning when they signed the Bill of Rights after their coronation in 1689. This gave proper power to Parliament and began the process of creating parliamentary democracy that we know today in Britain. Never would a monarch be able to rule with power unchecked. The first room is the guard chamber, which has an impressive collection of weapons such as muskets, bayonets, pistols and swords hung on the walls of the room. In the time of William and Mary's reign, the yeoman of the guard would have been stationed at the door to check the court courtiers before allowing them entry into the presence chamber and access to the king.
The presence chamber is the official throne room with the chair of a state under its formal canopy. Visitors still had to bow to the throne as they passed even if it was empty. The state apartments look empty to modern eyes, but they would once have been filled with beautifully dressed courtiers who would be meeting, gossiping and playing politics. The next room is the privy chamber which is considered the main ceremonial room in the palace where King William would greet statesmen, foreign ambassadors and other important dignitaries. When not receiving invited guests, the room was also used for court functions. In 1986, this area of Hampton Court had a severe fire, but luckily most of the furniture was saved. Fire destroyed the entire ceiling and the crystal chandelier. The room was eventually restored. The next room is the withdrawing room, which was one of the more exclusive areas of the state apartments and it is where members of the Privy Council, the Lord Chamberlain and other important officers of the court would have more private access to the King. In the next room, you will see the impressive Great Bed Chamber. This is not where the King slept but a ceremonial room where he would dress in the morning and disrobe in the evening. The room reflects the high status of the king and it is decorated with gilded furniture, beautiful tapestries and a luxurious bed covered with rich crimson taffeta curtains and bedding. would retire into the adjacent smaller bedchamber to sleep. Only the most trusted personal servants had access to this room. The painted ceiling by Vireo depicts Mars, the god of war, sleeping in the arms of Venus, the goddess of love. When the king wanted to work privately, he would use the room next to the smaller bedchamber called the king's closet, which functioned as a personal study. Here, a door leads into the queen's state apartments. 
there is also a small staircase that leads downstairs to three additional rooms known as the east closet the middle closet and the west closet this is where the king spent most of his time during the day and it is decorated with his most treasured works of art downstairs the rooms are more on more human scale this is where william the third really lived displaying his prized possessions and entertaining his favorite people because of the lock and key because the locks yes because um if you try to get in from say that or there that yeah. or that one, you'd need a key to come in and yeah. the only people that would have the key would either be the king himself king, yeah. or his chamberlain so only two people have the key oh okay so they think this must have been his private chamber because we also know that he was the one responsible for the massive trenches he dug into the gardens out there Oh. And the reason for that was because he wanted to see the river when he woke up in the morning. Oh. But obviously you can't see it if yeah, it's a bit of a hill in front of you. So yeah. you were really told to go on to get back out there, dig me a trench and I want to see that river. Okay. Oh, okay. So there's a way out from here? Oh, if, this one, oh, if you only follow the route to the end, down that staircase, you can start. Just round the way there. Also, on the main floor of the king's apartment, is the orange tree paved in a distinctive pattern the orange tree wow. is a type of greenhouse where orange trees and bay trees were kept in the winter months in the summer the trees would be moved outside onto the terrace which leads to the privy gardens orange trees were very popular in england during the reign of william and mary and also held special meaning because king william was from the dutch house of orange and some of the trees had been brought to england when he married queen mary which had originally grown in his gardens in holland Located at the far end of the orangery are several rooms that King William used for private entertaining. The drawing room and dining room. William's private dining room is laid out as it would have been in 1700 towards the end of his life when he sat surrounded by the famous Hampton Court beauties paintings. The table is set for an intimate dinner with the finest linens and gold plate serving pieces. The walls are hung with a series of portraits known as the Hampton Court beauties. This room is the final room in the king states apartments
After passing through the Tudor gates and courtyards, you can make your way to the Queen's Staircase, a lavish piece of artistry that must have provided the perfect foil for the shimmering silks and glittering diamonds sported by the courtiers. Up they go to the Queen's apartments, which have been transformed into an evocation of the early Georgian court as presided over by George I. George I did not arrive with his wife and instead headed the court alone. The lack of a queen must surely have been something of a disappointment to the British people, but the arrival of a Prince of Wales and his pretty amusing clever wife, Caroline, as well as their four children, must have gone a long way towards making up for a lack of a Hanoverian consort. When King George II succeeded his father in 1727, the palace entered its final phase as a royal residence. In 1734, Queen Caroline invited her favorite architect and designer, William Kent, to decorate the plain walls of the Queen's stairs. He created a Roman-style design, which included a tribute to Caroline, whom he compared to the ancient goddess Britannia. The guard chamber is the first room after the stairs. It has an enormous fireplace decorated with sculpted and creepy looking guardsmen. Then you move on to the presence chamber which is dominated as usual by the amazing portrait of Charles II at his coronation in 1661 and where the glorious celebrations of King George's first coronation in 1714 are brought to life with a special display explaining how he came to take the throne. From the presence chamber, you can then go on to the public dining room where the king would dine in state behind a specially constructed barrier while his gawking subjects filed past in a state of reverent hush. In the 18th century, the dining table would have been laid with shining tableware and heaped with all manner of meats, sweets treats and probably not much in the way of vegetables. This is when the king dined publicly. He did it in style. For special occasions, the dining table was dressed and starched linen, intricately folded and shaped into heraldic beasts, vegetables and animals. When the king was abroad, courtiers, dignitaries and ambassadors waited in the privy chamber for an audience with the prince and princess. The royal couple would sit together in state 
beneath this great throne canopy. So this is the privy chamber for ambassadors the drawing room was a weekly occasion where lucky courtiers would meet with the king or prince and princess. On Sunday afternoons, the drawing room was a more formal occasion. Courtiers flooded in the circle and if they were in favor, George I or the royal couple spoke to them in turn. Here they might also call for card tables to be brought out for gaming. Many courtiers gambled for enormous sums of money both at the card table and investing in over-ambitious stock market schemes. King, prince and courtiers alike lost a fortune in the fifth great stock market crash in 1720, known as the South Sea Bubble. The government even tried to ban gambling outside the court, but without much success. and Princess of Wales completed this opulent bedchamber in 1715 to receive leading courtiers at the morning ceremony called the Levy. Two years after James Thornhill painted the royal family's portraits on the ceiling, a monumental row between the king and prince resulted in George I banishing the prince and princess from his palaces and cruelly separating them from their children. Courtiers who chose to side with the prince and princess's court were no longer welcomed at the king's court. To keep the crowd back during the levy, a rail was introduced. This rare giltwood bed rail was used by George I and Charles II before him and was probably made for Charles' mother Queen Henrietta Maria. <laughs> 